So, their professionals, their colleagues, uh, their students, so many students, their guests, good afternoon in this magnificent Aula Magna. I'm Cristina Basso, Vice Director for International Relations. I would like to welcome you on behalf of our Rector, Professor Daniela Mappelli, who cannot be here today with us uh, to open this event. As you well know, the 2022, we are celebrating the 800th anniversary of our, um, of course, anniversary, University of Padua from the foundation. And among the special events, there is a, a series of Nobel uh, lecture given by Nobel laureates in various fields. The field of today is physiology and medicine, and uh, our university can count several highlights along the centuries in this field. You can think about uh, Gabriele Falloppio, Realdo Colombo, Andrea Vesaglio, Fabricius Apacomendente, William Harvey from UK, and Giovanni Battista Morgani, but last but not least, the father of modern pathology, intended as gross pathology. Then, in 19th century, Virchow proposed that omnicellular a cellula itself come from another cell, which became a fundamental concept for cell theory and introduced the era of cellular and molecular pathology. As part of uh, its 8th anniversary celebration, today we have the honor to host the Nobel Lecture of Sir Paul Nurse. Professor Nurse shared the 2001 Nobel Prize Laureate in Medicine with uh, Artwell and Timant for their discoveries of key regulators of the cell cycle. It is my pleasure to leave the floor to Professor Telmo Piavani to more properly introduce uh, our distinguished guest, Professor Nurse, with a very challenging title, What is Life? Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for this introduction. And, and welcome to you all. I'm so happy to see so, so many young students. So because this afternoon, we will share a lot of messages related to exactly to the great theoretical background of, of life sciences. So, what is life? Uh, Paul Nurse really doesn't need that as an introduction. He is one of, of the most important scientists in life sciences. He won a Nobel Prize, as you, as you heard, in, uh, for medicine in 2001 for his discoveries on life cycle and life uh, duplication. Um, he has a wonderful career. Now he is director of the Francis Crick Institute, and he has been president of the Rockefeller University and the Royal Society in, in UK, and, and he's a great biologist and, 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 and geneticist. Uh, one of the uh, great occasion, uh, furthermore, that we have today to discuss with, to dialogue with Paul Nurse is that two years ago, and, and one year ago for the Italian edition, he published uh, a very interesting book with this classical and very ambitious title, so What is Life? That is a title, maybe you remember, that was exactly the title uh, chosen by Erwin Schrodinger for his classic book about what is life in 1944, uh, immediately, quite immediately after the Second World War. Uh, the, great, uh, the great founder of the quantum mechanics was writing this book about the general definition of life. And in this new edition of the, of the question, the, the, the answer proposed by Paul Nurse is related to five principles of uh, what we can consider uh, a, living, a living entity. But we will discuss about this principle. So it's a great pleasure to, to dialogue with you. We decided not to have a, Nobel, a classical standard Nobel lecture, but a conversation. And then Professor Nurse will be available to discuss. So we'll be happy to, to share uh, questions uh, with you. So my, my first question, Paul, is related to your favorite organisms. Because in this book, you say that these are butterflies, but immediately after, after butterflies uh, is yeast. Because you think that yeast is this wonderful mushroom, unicellular mushroom, with many uh, unexpected and very interesting connections with us, with multicellular mammals like us. So can you explain to us why you love so much uh, yeast since your young uh, period in a brewery, right? In a in a brewery lab. So he is, he is a common li li line for your for your life. And welcome, and it's a great to to have you as a guest here. Ye yes, it, it started in a brewery, and I still like beer. I have to um, say, can I just say how excited I am to be here? Um, 
the, the birth of modern science, the birth of modern medicine, 800 years of a great university. I've been wanting to come here for decades, and now I'm here. So I am very pleased to see all of you. Yeast, why yeast? I, you know, it has to do with the tree of life, really. Um, the first tree of life was in Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And that tree of life um, indicated in a, in a rather um, impressive pictorial representation that all living things on our planet were associated, connected, connected by descent. And what that in turn meant, of course, is that um, understanding a simple organism like yeast is informative about all other living things, including ourselves. And because a yeast is A, simple, B, easy to investigate, C, cheap to investigate, it is a very powerful model system. There's other model systems, um, flies, worms, mice. Yeast is the simplest eukaryote. And what we learn from yeast has turned out to be relevant to ourselves. And we may get into that a bit later, because I had a euphoric moment in contributing to that connection. So yeast I studied because I thought it might inform us about principles of life, particularly the reproduction of one cell into two, which is the basis of reproduction and growth in all living things. And when I started, and I was in my early 20s, and this is 50 years ago, when I started, I just thought maybe, just maybe, by studying this simple yeast, I might help understand a little bit what happens in cells of all other life. I didn't realize how that really became a reality and how it turned out that the way yeasts control their reproduction of one cell into two is essentially the same as ours. But maybe we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Can, can you tell us the story of the original experiment? Because it's, it, it's funny and it's quite serendipitous, right? So because you discover that, 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 that the human gene can activate is So you discover exactly in the lab this connection. Yes, this is probably the most exciting experiment that I did. And when I say I, actually, by that time I was running a lab, and most of the work was done by a colleague of mine called Melanie Lee, who went on to have a glittering career in biotechnology, and who I actually um, met only two days ago, was still very um, uh, close in contact. So it was Melanie who did much of the work. Now, uh, I need to explain a little to see why, to explain why it, it, it was important. What I'd done in, in, in yeast, and when I again say me, it was me and my colleagues in the, in, in the lab, was identify um, a set of genes that controlled the reproduction of cells. Now, yeast has about 5,000 genes. We sequenced them all. It was the third eukaryote to be sequenced, so we were the third one up. Um, it, we showed it had 5,000 genes genes, and did screens, and these I did myself, to identify genes that were needed for the reproduction of cells. I used that word needed, required, but actually I was interested not just in what was necessary for the machinery of cell reproduction. I was interested mainly in what controlled that machinery, what was the sort of controlling force, if you like. And I wrestled with that problem because I couldn't quite work out um, how to find the controlling genes. Uh, we know, for example, now, because we've done the work after um, sequencing 5,000 genes, that about 500 of them are required for the reproductive process, to make DNA, to uh, make the chromosomes separate at mitosis and, and so on. But what actually controlled them? Now, I didn't solve that problem by thinking. I solved that problem because nature gave it to me. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I was looking for mutants that couldn't reproduce. 
and they could continue to grow. So I was looking for cells that be became very large, very large, because they could continue to grow, but they couldn't reproduce, they couldn't divide. And then I saw, under the microscope, cells that were dividing at a smaller size than normal cells. And it was like my brain just sort of lit up. Because I hadn't thought of that before, and it's obvious that what, how to identify a control is what is rate limiting for progression through the cell cycle, as we call it, the reproductive cycle. And if you were to alter a gene that controlled the overall progression, then if you could speed it up, the cells would divide before they had grown to the normal amount. It's so simple, it sounds idiotic. Uh, but actually, nobody else had thought of it either. So, I mean, it, um, well, it, it obviously wasn't quite so obvious. A metaphor for it is like a car. If you were a Martian, and you, were, you came down from Mars, and you saw a, a car, uh, and you wanted to know how it worked, the way you would do it is to take bits off it and see what went wrong. Now, if you take the wheels off, it doesn't go. That means it can't reproduce, if we use the metaphor. But there are a few components that make the car go faster, not slower. And the ones that make it go faster are the controlling ones, the, the accelerator, the gears maybe. And very few components in the car can make the car go faster. Many components, if you take them out, can make it go slower. So this mutant, which I isolated, I was working in Edinburgh, and it was small, and the Scottish word for small is we, a we thing. So I called it a we mutant. I thought it was a very amusing name in 1975, but the joke does wear a bit thin after 50 years, it has to be said. But this we mutant unlocked it. I know this is a long answer, but I hope it's okay. It unlocked the control because this defined a gene that was rate limiting for overall progression through the cell cycle. It was the original gene that encoded what we now know, and there may be biologists in the room, a cyclin dependent kinase. And using actually classical genetics, because this was before molecular genetics at this stage, I built up a sort of abstract picture of how th this gene was controlled by several other genes. Then cloned the genes as molecular biology came on board and worked out roughly how it was working. But to be quite honest, I may like yeast. I think yeast is fascinating. Most of the world do not. I'm realistic about it. But I thought if I could show that humans were cells were controlled in the same way, then that's altogether a different story. One, people would be interested in it because we're self-centered and interested in human beings. And secondly, it would mean everything in between from yeast to humans was controlled in the same way. So back to Melanie Lee. We looked to see whether we could find the human gene that might be equivalent to that yeast gene. This was before human had been sequenced. You know, this is uh, 15, 20 years before. And just to uh, say how we eventually did it, because um, for two years we tried conventional ways and it just failed, and I won't even try and explain them, but they did not work. But we got hold of a, the first human gene library um, which, was, uh, which had been made. Uh, it was uh, publicly available a few months after it was made. And sort of metaphorically, we sprinkled those genes on a mutant that couldn't divide because it was defective in this controlling gene and asked the question, is there a human gene that can perform the same function as that defective yeast gene? Because if there was, then if it went into a yeast cell and worked, then that yeast cell would be able to grow and divide. This experiment had absolutely no right to work. Absolutely no right to work. But just sometimes they do, and this one did. A colony grew on the plate. 
We isolated the human plasmid at back. We got the gene. We sequenced it. It took us three months, you won't believe, to do two killer bases. Now we do it in about two seconds, but um, then it took two months. All the time, I felt like Jesus Christ being taken to the top of the mountain with the promised land in front of me, and the devil was going to just push me off, and this, it would all disappear. And then finally, it came out on the ticker tape. The gene was 61% identical in amino acid sequence, and only one amino acid different in size. And this meant that the control of cell reproduction in yeast and humans was the same, and it had been the same for the last 1,500 million years, which is the time for the common ancestor approximately between yeast and human beings. So for 1,500 million years, this had been conserved sufficiently that we could take the human gene out and it would work perfectly, by the way. I don't mean, you know, approximately, I mean perfectly. It was a sense of wonder. It does connect all life. You cannot, I looked at that clone, I looked at the sequence and you could not believe it. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful example of the ingenuity of, of, of the science, science methodology before molecular genetics, before human genome project and, and so on. So, that's, that's a great story. Uh, at the end of your book, you, you, you condense your definition of life into three principles, mainly. One is the ability to evolve, of course. Second one is to be delimited by communicating with, 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 with uh, physical entities, like uh, mainly cell, with the membranes. And the third one is, be, you say, be physical, chemical, and informational uh, machines. And and you use this, this term that is wetware, not, not hardware, not software, but wetware. So can you, can you explain to us in which sense we can consider a cell something like a computational machine? Yes, so just to say one or two things on, on what you said. The first of those, that a living thing is something, an object, an entity that can evolve by natural selection, was the idea of Muller, um, a famous... Um, geneticists worked in US origins from Europe um, in the 1960s, and it's a very clever way uh, to, uh, to view it. So just, it wasn't uh, my idea. The second thing in this, uh, uh, about this book was, I wanted to write something which would still be true 50 and 100 years from now. So it didn't try to look over the horizon. It just took the principles we were already aware of um, and put them together in a particular way. I, I've read too many books and watched too many TV programs that disappear after two, three, four years because you're always overlooking over the horizon and you get it wrong. I don't mind getting it wrong, but if you're going to make the effort of writing a book, you better get it right, I, th I thought. Wetware. I'd like to, th again, think it was my idea. It wasn't. The, it was Dennis Bray, a friend of mine who worked in... In, in Cambridge. What does it mean? Well, um, I was arguing that, the, that life, as you said, a chemical, physical, and informational machine. It is built on information. Biological science, we think of it as chemistry, biochemistry and molecular, but it is also a science of information, of processing information and using information. Increasingly, that's becoming a uh, um, um, uh, clear that they're informational um, machines. And wetware is to contrast hardware because when we think of informational machines, we immediately think of computers. And computers have a certain set of hardware which we then manipulate with software. And the hardware cannot be rewired. But if you think of the computational work going inside of a cell which is based upon chemicals in solution chemistry, because you're connecting different molecules through solution, you can reconnect them in different ways that didn't exist before. Now, 
we're only scratching the surface there as to what that might mean, but it, it's becoming clear that it, that happens. So Dennis called this wetware because what most people would do is say, oh, we'll take a radio circuit and then put uh, you know, names of genes on it. But that isn't quite right because those are connected in a hard-wired way. What you have with the computational, informational activities of a, of a cell of life is wetware because you can reconnect it in different sorts of ways. I, I predict that over the next decades we will see that increasingly happen and it will enrich our understanding of how information is processed. Sure. Um, I have a, a a quite theoretical question, because in, in your five principles about life, uh, there is a role for teleonomy, right? You say that organisms uh, behave like a whole, uh, finalized with, so with, a, with, a, with a tendency to, to have a purpose. So reproduction, uh, uh, self-organization, uh, homeostasis, and so on. You know that purpose in biology is a quite controversial uh, Cancer. So, in which sense you, you, you think that, that organisms are teleonomic uh, entities? I lit a purpose around the book to be controversial, just to make people feel uncomfortable. It, it is absolutely true. Now, the word you use, teleonomic, it's very close to teleological. Teleonomic, I first saw it being used, and I think it was um, first um, uh, 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 done by Mono, I think, in his yeah, book of 1973. And uh, I don't know, I never met him. I did meet Jacob, but I never met Mono. Um, and he uses that word to put a bit of distance from teleological. Because purpose is a charged word in biology. For the, because just behind it is um, a, a purposeful behaviors, a divine creator is only a step or two away. And that's the reason why. It is, um, it's not light. I'm comfortable with it, completely comfortable with it. Now, uh, oh, by the way, not with divine creators creating life and uh, governing evolution. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with the word teleonomic and purpose. And why is that? Because living things behave as a whole. And what we mean when we say holistic and behaving as a whole is that they have purposeful behaviors to deliver something as a whole, which makes no sense in the molecular details that sit beneath it. By the way, it's not that I think there's a contradiction between reductionism and holism. They're perfectly integrated one with another. I think it's a false um, war that can happen there. But we have molecular details that lead to purposeful behaviors as a whole. Purposeful behaviors like homeostasis, like growth, like reproduction, all, by the way, encapsulated in a cell, which is the simplest entity which unambiguously is alive. We can talk about viruses, which are a bit complicated, but cells unambiguously alive. So I think it's useful to think about purpose. It's useful. I'm a molecular geneticist. Molecular genetics only makes sense when you think about the, uh, the behavior of the cell as a whole or the living organism as a whole. Geneticists are holists, investigating them in reductionist ways. And purposeful behaviors are central to that. So I have no problem with it. I, I have to say, my colleagues do. And I think they've just got scared, you know, scared, whereas they should just stick to the principles that really matter. There's nothing to be frightened of. Yeah. Um, in, in, in the book, in the page of the book, you, you quote a wonderful uh, sentence by Sidney Brenner, your colleague and, and friend, when he said, mathematics is the art of the perfect, physics is the art of the optimal, while, while biology is the art of the satisfying, in the sense that it works even if it's never perfect. So. Can you explain to us why do you agree with this sentence about life as uh, always a little bit imperfect but creative? Sidney Brenner, brilliant, by the way. 
absolutely brilliant, died um, about three or four years ago now. Very, very imaginative, very, very clever, and always witty. I'd always want to sit next to him at dinner because it would be highly entertaining. This is a typical witty sentence from him. Uh, uh, making fun, by the way, of everybody, from mathematicians through to um, the biologists. And um, what does it mean? It means um, that life is functioning at a level, it's evolved to a level, which actually only is a level which is better than the competition that existed before. And we stumble into the mistake of thinking that life is perfect. And you even have biologists saying it, it's perfect and that ev you know, it uses energy to the greatest efficiency. How often do people say thing, things like that? It's a nonsense. It's really a nonsense. It's simply evolved to a point where it can outcompete the competition. It hasn't been designed intelligently to be perfect because it's not how it works. It involves against the, it competes with the competition. I don't like the word that, but it's easily uh, easier uh, to, to grasp it. Um, and is the best thing at that moment that is around, which is not the same thing as perfection. And this may be useful. I'm going to say something here, which, which is, um, I find interesting. The first l um, single-celled life on the planet is around 3.5 billion years ago, where we see the first fossils. You would have thought the most difficult part of evolution would be creating something that was alive. Uh, yet that occurred in about 500, 600 million years, I mean, by the time the Earth had cooled down. It took another two and a half billion years or more for single-celled life to become multicellular, which is, you would think, a relatively trivial transformation compared with making a cell. And I wondered about that, and I have something relevant to this satisfactory um, point that you brought up. Because maybe those cells that existed were hugely inefficient. Maybe they were so inefficient that Every time they tried to reproduce, they mostly got it wrong. So they were very, very slow at growing. Now, if they were slow at growing, but a little bit faster than another cell that was very slow at growing, that would have survived and it would have evolved. But you could not make a multicellular organism out of cells that were constantly failing in reproduction. It wouldn't work. So maybe, you had to move to some state closer to perfection, and that took a lot of years. And I know people talk about oxygen and all these other things, and I'm sure they're important. But maybe what we were looking at is pathetically competing cells, but which were better than the competition. Now, I use that only as an example of thinking like this might be il I illuminating it, because we are not perfect, we know that. The cells we work on are not perfect, we know that. We may be able to help them along a little bit with synthetic biology and genetic engineering and so on, but it will still not be perfect. It will take probably tens if not hundreds of million years to get that little bit better all the time. And that's what Sydney meant by satisfactory. It's satisfactory compared with the competition. It is neither optimal nor perfect. Absolutely. And another reason could be also the fact that natural selection always works with on, on the existing material. So with, with the constraints of the, of the history of the past. So it's not like an engineering process from zero, but it's a continuous change of the, the material. So with the, with the history of constraint, the contingency. And I was thinking when, when you explained this, this long period of unicellular evolution, that according to some uh, cancer biologists, cancer uh, could be considered so dangerous because according to them, he's something like a coming back to the selfishness of the original unicellular cells in a body. So you, you say in the book that we should have an alliance between evolutionary biologists and cancer biologists. We have to consider cancer as an evolutionary process. So in, in, in which sense? Because I think it's very interesting this 
connection? Well, I, 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 I do argue that because I think um, cancer biologists have much to learn from evolutionary biologists. Yeah, that, that, that's been evident for 30 years, 40, 50 years or more. Um, because cancer is a um, somatic genetic disease, basically. Um, because the processes that lead to evolution, that is um, genetic changes, which then lead to um, living organisms that can outcompete by reproducing more, is very similar to what happens with a cancer cell, where a cancer cell is also um, undergoing genetic change, albeit in the body, not between um, um, generations, and is outcompeting the behaving cells in the tissue, which are not doing that. And that is the, uh, that's why it is essentially an evolutionary, um, an evolutionary disease. Um, but the evolutionary biologists, and of course you're an evolutionary biologist yourself, have thought so much more carefully about this than cancer biologists until very recently. So I've argued for a long time that the cancer biologists who tend to live, uh, work in biomedical type institutions, the evolutionary biologists often very distant. So in my institute, I, I run this Francis Crick Institute, um, I've hired some evolutionary biologists. So we have the right theoretical background to advise our cancer biologists. And this is really, really useful because the sophistication of the thinking of the evolutionary biologists is far beyond now um, what we've been doing in cancer. Now, DNA sequencing allows us to really analyze that in much more detail. So we have the methods to do it, and now we need the thinking to do it, and that will come from evolutionary biologists, in my, in my opinion. That's great. This is a good suggestion for the Department of Biology here and the biomedical departments in Padua as well. Uh, it, one of the five principles, uh, of course, related to DNA, right? And the wonderful properties of the DNA to be quite paradoxically so stable in, in evolution, but at the same time variable, so able to accumulate mutations and variants. So at the same time, stability and change for three billions and five point uh, five billion years. Um, this universality of DNA is also the theoretical base for genetic engineering, and you wrote about this uh, in the book. And, and you write two quite seemingly different things, that genetic engineering is one of the most powerful tool for the future, right, for agriculture, for industry, and so on, for, for, for health, of course. But also, more we do uh, uh, genetic engineering, you, you, you say, and more we understand that we don't know, so that, that we have a lot of ignorance about DNA. So what do you mean by this, this contradiction? Not, not contradiction, but this two uh, things. Oh dear, dear, there is so much in that question, really. Um, I want to say a couple more things, introduction for it. One of the wonders of life is a consequence of it being built on polymers. Polymers of nucleic acid, which are informational, digital informational storage devices, who tuck the nucleotides into the center of the molecule where it's protected, and where the chemistry is not very interesting or exciting. So it can encode information, but it can't actually turn it into chemistry because it doesn't have the variety of chemistry. And then what we have in life is the ability to go from a polymer of nucleic acid into a polymer of proteins made up of 20 different amino acids with different chemistries that can fold the protein into different shapes and produces a wonderful variety of different chemistries, which is, of course, not so stable as the DNA. So linear information, which, by the way, was invented by life over three billion years ago. We think we invented it with computers 30 years ago or with language, I um, mean, 3,000, 4,000, or 10,000 years ago. But of course it wasn't, it's the nature of life. But it's turned into active chemistry through this amazing trick. And I, 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 it's wonderful, actually. I, so much so that I think that, um, that if we ever find life elsewhere, it may be on another planet, another solar system, another galaxy. It, 
It may not be built on carbon polymers, but it will be built, in my view, on polymers because they allow the storage of information and the ability to change that information into chemical action. And that isn't such an easy thing to actually um, do. Now, that was my introduction, but I've lost your question. What was your question again? Because I've wandered off. <laughs> the ignorance, the, the, the power of genetic engineering, but also ah, yes, the ignorance, the degree of ignorance that you understand. Good, thank you. I, I get distracted. It's, um, so, uh, we have power in being able to manipulate now with genetic engineering and, uh, uh, and um, uh, synthetic biology. And that is powerful. But... For it to be effective and safe, we have to understand more than we have and that we can at the moment. Now, some things are... Uh, let's take um, human disease because it's, it's one that is very, um, very illustrative in, in, this, um, in this situation. If you take a monogenic disease like cystic fibrosis, for example, we know that the disease is caused by a mutation in a particular gene. If that gene could be corrected properly, and at this moment we can't guarantee doing that, but let's say we could, we know in that case that will deal with the disease, and in my view we have a responsibility, if we can do it, to deliver that. If we now move to other characteristics, characteristics um, which you know, those in California talk about all the time with their startup companies, for example, um, like um, intelligence and height and, um, you know, beauty and so on. Um, we understand that so little that tinkering with that. Sometimes I hear my genetical colleagues saying, uh, you know, a musician's got perfect pitch or something. You know, being a good musician, only one part of it is having perfect pitch, and that must be obviously the case. We simply do not understand enough about how genes produce lots of human behaviors to be able to think about doing anything about them, or for that matter, in my view, um, to actually do anything about them. To cure a disease, I think, is something that is acceptable if we know enough. These other things we certainly don't know enough, and even if we did, I don't think we should be doing it. It just isn't, it isn't right. Clear. Uh, I have a few other questions for you, and then it's time for, for questions for, for the audience, so be prepared. Um, I have to, to, to ask you something about vaccines, because you, 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 you write in the book something that is very impressive. You say in the book that to be against vaccines, it's, it, vaccines is not just in the case of COVID-19, but, but in a general sense, it's not just wrong. It's unethical. It's immoral. Yeah, in which I, sense? I do. Sorry. Yes, I do say that. And, and uh, maybe that's... We have Hello, change. yes. Oh, that's okay. yep. um, why do I say that? Well, often those who are against vaccination will say it's an individual's choice. And... It's my choice if I don't want to be vaccinated. And, of course, um, it's an argument. But the point, of course, is that they, therefore, do not think of their colleagues. What they're saying is, I don't want to be vaccinated. I'm prepared to take the risk of, be of the disease, if they were rational about it, because I know it, there's an irrationality, which I'll come to in a moment. But what they forget is that they have a public responsibility to those around them. And if they were to go and live in the middle of a desert and see nobody and, and uh, say that they shouldn't be vaccinated, okay, but they don't. They want to wander in society thinking of their rights, if I can be strong about it, and not thinking about the rights of others. And that's why it's a moral question. Now, they tend to argue that it's, that it's dangerous and, uh, and the, the, it kills people and, uh, and so on. For which there is the evidence, of course you do get deaths by vaccination, but it's so rare and, uh, that compared with the uh, numbers of lives saved, you take that chance. Now you do that with any medicine. 
I mean, anything. I mean, or food. You know, peanuts will kill some people. So, of course. Um, but it, 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 it doesn't mean... <laughs> it is so ridiculous to say, you know, that because it kills one person in 10 million that, um, uh, that we're going to stop doing it. But it's those sorts of arguments. So I think it's a foolish scientifically, but it's, I think, mistaken morally. Because often they try and take a high moral ground. And it's a mistake morally because they do not think of their colleagues. They do not think of other human beings. That's the reason I argue. Absolutely. And maybe one, it's one of the reasons why you, during the pandemic, raised your voice in a very strong and effective way against populistic politicians, right? So, and the danger of, of populism. Uh, so, up now, today, what do you think about, after the pandemic, would be the best relationship between science and politics? Because, you know, in Italy, the situation is very different with respect to UK. We don't have the Royal Society. And, and, and what we have seen in Italy is the fact that every scientist spoke by, by, by himself during the pandemic, without an institutional relationship between the scientific community and, digital, and political digital. So what do you think about this policy? I, I, well, thank you for that question, which isn't an easy one, by the way. Um, and why do I say thank you? Because I would make a case that one of the most important constitutional challenges we face on the planet in the coming um, decades is a proper relationship between science and scientific evidence and political activity and political outcome. And the rise of populism, and we see it, we've seen it in this country, we have it actually in the UK where I never thought we would see it, not to the same extent, but we, that's the cause of Brexit, which by the way is the biggest disaster for my country in my lifetime. I repeat, the biggest disaster for my, we, it, I cannot believe what has happened to us. Back to science and politics, just for, uh, uh, again. The, the point is that we live in an increasingly scientifically sophisticated world where science impacts much of our life. I mean, sitting in this room, it's being warmed by science. You're hearing me because of science. I mean, we, you haven't got COVID because of science. Or if you do have COVID, it won't kill you because of science. Um, and we have to, therefore, integrate somehow scientific thinking into political decisions. And that isn't so easy because science is complicated. And not everybody gets it, including the scientists themselves. And sometimes we like it was the case at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, scientists didn't really know quite what advice to give. They did their best, um, but some of the things were wrong, like the importance of washing hands, for example, which I noticed still happens when, of course, it's not transmitted in that, in, in, in that way. But trying to integrate complex things involving science with the political system, we have to solve that. It is the biggest challenge. We can't go on with populism because populism leads to terrible things. We've seen it. We've seen it earlier last century. We've seen it in Brazil in the, um, um, the last um, um, five years. Because populism is no respecter of evidence. Populism is no respecter of reason. And as a consequence of that, um, the, the, our politics gets tainted and cannot work properly. Now, how can we get it to work properly? Because I think the opposite solution, an entirely technocratic political system, is also not right. I mean, because that pushes the, um, uh, the, uh, away from the debate the fact that we are human beings living in a society. So we have to find a middle way. So let's take some problems, just to illustrate what I mean by that. Um, when does life begin? Now, this is a question we cannot answer. Some would say, when you have a fertilized egg, 
although the oocyte and the sperm before it would, of course, be life as well. It used to be said before we understood biology more by many societies and religions, the birth of a child. We now have some sort of compromise, like the ability of a, a child to live independently from um, the, their mother with the right support, so 18 weeks, 22 weeks, something like this. But at the same time, we're queasy, and for good reasons, uh, working on embryos which are older than two weeks old, for example, because that's the present um, guideline, maybe one week, but I think it's two now. So what does this tell us? It tells us that science can inform difficult decisions, but the decisions have to be compatible with what society is comfortable with. And not all societies are the same, but they have to use the information that science can provide and the rationalism that science can provide, but then embed it within their society. And if you ignore the rationalism and ignore the evidence, as the populists do, it isn't sufficient. And if you go the other way and ignore what society needs uh, to take account of, then it also won't work. How I've tried to deal with it, let's say with, uh, with GM crops, for example, is that the responsibility of a scientist is of scientists, it's first of all to identify when applications might be a real issue or whether the knowledge might be a real issue. And then start as quickly as possible with a debate on the public stage, a debate that envi involves public leaders but also um, talking to the public, not through interest groups, NGOs who will always have a particular position, but talking to the public about an issue. In the case of GM, um, I was involved in a, a public engagement exercise 20 years ago when things, um, when Monsanto was trying to do its unsquashy tomato thing. And no, do you know, I had lots and lots of conversations. We, what we would do, I was, I was at the Royal Society, what we would do is we would put together in a room people off the street We'd pay them 20 quid to have, uh, 20 pounds, uh, to spend a couple of hours. We would explain to them what GM was and how it, how it worked, and then we'd ask them what worried them about it. And do you know what the answer was? They did not want to eat food which had genes in it. Now, that was the common answer. Now, no scientist would think of that because they never bothered to ask the public. Because we know all food has genes in it, okay. But of course that had never been explained to them. So we get an outcome because we scientists are too lazy to find out what the problem is and to try and deliver it and to tell the politicians what they have to deal with it. If we'd done that, we might now have um, greater possibilities of using GM to cope with um, uh, increasing temperatures and drought and so on, and we're still struggling to put that into place. So scientists have to have the humility to ask the question of the public, to hear what they are concerned, and then to, to bring about the debate, but not control the debate. And we don't have the political systems in place to deliver that, in my opinion, anywhere in the world. The UK, I think, doesn't reasonably well, um, but it is nowhere near what we need for the coming decades. Uh, this morning, I, 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 I was watching in the TV the international press release, and I thought, I have to ask Paul exactly this point, because they were saying that in UK now you have a debate about the fact that, in the case in, for, for example, in the case of immigration, now you are checking, like in an experiment, that the argument for Brexit were wrong, because the uh, prediction about the immigration uh, effects of Brexit are exactly the opposite now. You need yeah. more immigrants. So and I thought, in this case, we can, we can have something like a scientific experiment, so you can check the, scientifically the effects of a politics, of, of a politic, political choice. And my second question is, do you think that Brexit is irreversible, or can we wait for you coming back to our family, mm. <laughs> European family? Right, okay. Now I'll go more political. 
The first thing, the best thing about Brexit is to show to the rest of Europe what a disaster it would be not to get Europe to work properly. And we will suffer for your benefit. So Europe, by the way, is nowhere near perfect. I've done a lot of things in Europe. Of course it's irritating, of course it's frustrating, of course it's bureaucratic. You think the UK government isn't irritating, bureaucratic and all those things? Of course it is. We got rid of nothing. But what we have shown is what a disaster it is. Our economy is worse than yours. Immigration isn't controlled. We're not working with Europe. Science is going down the tubes because we can't uh, associate with ERC. And still, what used to be, I'm not a Tory party, but it used to be fairly sensible because it was taken over by the populists who were appealing to issues to do with basically racism and immigration rather than trying to deal with them in a grown-up sort of way. And we are suffering the consequences of an inadequate government, an inadequate leadership, and still are doing it. Right, will it be reversed? Of course it will be reversed, because it's so idiotic. How can we thrive when we're not part of a common market with our colleagues? What we're going to do, what we're going to do, we're going to suddenly start um, trading with Australia, population 25 million, 8,000 miles away. And that is much better than with a block of 350 million, um, 30 miles away. I mean, it's a nonsense, top to bottom. America is going to work with us. No, they're not. They're going to work with America. We've seen it. Trump couldn't care less. Biden is worried about the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, you know? Oh, by the way, what did Boris say, Boris Johnson? It's oven ready. It's all ready to be produced. Did we solve the Northern Ireland ba um, boundary? I don't remember it. And now we're seeing the consequences of it. So what I think will happen will be this. We will lose our present government, okay, because they've not shown what they are. We will get um, a different party or a different coalition. They won't take on Brexit before it because the Tories will scream about immigration. They will make Brexit work by linking with the common market. Then somebody will notice Ah, yes, we're following the rules, but we don't have any impact on making the rules. Maybe. How can we solve that? Oh, we can go back into the European Union. Not sure in my lifetime, we may get some of the way there, but I predict that eventually it will happen, it must happen, because what we have now is utter, total nonsense. We really, hope, we really hope for that. I have a final question, and then we have time for questions from the, from the audience. Because in your book, I read a wonderful definition of, of the social aspect of science. So uh, scientific research is intensely individual, but at the same time, totally collective. And when we say collective, I think that you mean also with diversity. Okay. So my final question is related to the fact that today is the International Day for the Fight Against Violence against women. So what is the situation for in, in UK about the, the gender balance and what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I think it is very personal and it is completely collective. It is, uh, it's unusual. I mean, uh, that goes for most human activities. Novelists, of course, they write alone, but they interact with, uh, with the culture and other novelists. But in science, it is absolutely embedded. Um, it is seldom that you can achieve much alone you are much, much weaker. A network of minds, technologies, and cultures aimed at trying to understand the world is so much more powerful than a single individual. Single individuals can have a lot of impact within it, but it's an impact that is only delivered effectively, in my view, by constant interaction with others and, uh, and interdisciplinary activities and technologies and so on. And let's put that more in perspective to deal with diversity, because you're right, it's exactly what I mean. We do not all think quite the same. We have different cultures with different emphases. I mean, from Western Europe through to the Far East. Um, we have men, we have women. We tend to think somewhat differently. Let, let's not say we're all the same. We're not all the same. 
but we all contribute something to the endeavor. We have different ethnic minorities. We all contribute something to the endeavor. So science is highly interactive. You don't always collaborate. Sometimes the word collaborate is used all the time. I barely collaborate with anybody in the sense of publishing papers together. I interact with people all the time. Some people love collaborating. They bring this technology and so on, and that's great. Um, but I talk a lot with people and I interact a lot with, with people. So it is as a community, a diversified community, and we are making progress with gender. I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen that happen. It's still um, to be um, fully developed, but we are making progress. We have to make progress with diversity elsewhere. Indeed individualistic, but indeed totally part of a society, a society which has got an objective, a, a high objective, of pursuing the truth and finding out how the world and how our souls work. And to do that, we need the work of the community working together, and we need great individuals within that. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Paul. And now it's time for your questions. And Ma Franco has a microphone for you. And you can... Over there, Franco. Ah, okay, another microphone. Please. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, uh, three questions. Uh, the first is, so you mentioned the transmission of life as a mostly linear process. Um, uh, at the same time, phys physicians, uh, well, physicists actually, are uh, exploring quantum computing, which is a language where things are, can be here and there at the same time, true and false at the same time, and that would add complexity to life. Do you think in the next future, life might integrate this extremely complex language and evolve to something we have never seen? This was the first question. The second one is... <laughs> One at a time, well, one at a time. <laughs> I'm too old to have that long memory, okay. So I think the question was about the um, um, different languages and integrating different languages. And I think this is a very interesting, I've written a little bit about this because I, I think that um, different um, scientific endeavors, it's not just science, but different scientific endeavors put greater emphases on different sorts of language. If you look at theoretical physics, it's completely built upon mathematics. It, it makes no sense in the language of common sense, really. It's built on mathematics. And uh, that is the simplest example. But there may be languages, and this is what I have written about, where, where we can, in biology, need a different sort of language, maybe, to actually express what's going on. And that's to do and you'll, you'll hear my hesitancy, because I don't really know what I'm meaning. With, I don't have the language for what I'm trying to say, really. But um, because of the complexity of life, I wonder whether the way of thinking of language, the digital linear way of thinking, is in fact entirely suitable for a complex network. And I've tried this out on people, and who understand networks, and they say I'm wrong, and I'm, I, I, I probably am. But I think we should keep the door open to different sorts of thinking, because thinking is sort of based on language, different sorts of thinking that can embrace complexity and complex interactions. I do not know what that looks like, um, and it may be nonsense. Second question. Thank you. So uh, the second question is, um, uh, as humanity, we are thinking, and this is also a stream of literature on that, about space colonization and how to select the best fit people for exploration and possible colonization of exos ex exoplanets, so uh, planets you know, beyond the solar system. And I know it's an extremely complex question, but 
if you were to um, decide what traits were relevant for us to select people to explore and possibly colonize those very far away planets in, in the future, what do you think would, that would be important? Um, this is extraterrestrial life, uh, but I, which, uh, which bit of it? <laughs> Oh, selection of people. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, I wouldn't let scientists do it. I can tell you. I can tell you that. Um, do you know, I don't want to answer your question because I don't think it's quite right. Okay. Um, the, uh, what, why do I say it's not quite right? Because we do not always respect all aspects of the diversity of life because we tend to make judgments based on the diversity that is important at that time in the circumstances where we are. And it could well be that on the planet, you know, Alpha Cygni or whatever star, something Proxima, I think it is, as astronomers in the room, the diversity of skill sets that we have here may not be the appropriate ones for the other, uh, the other place, we can't predict them. You could say there's certain commonalities, like being decent human beings is one I choose, but the particular other aspects, I don't think we can choose. So my answer would be diversity. Vega, please. Yeah, uh, there just are? the third question, if I may, just very no, briefly. No, 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 it's, no? it's okay. don't monopolize the, the debate, thank you. We have other questions? Is it on? Okay. Yeah. My question is regarding the editing tool that you talked about for genome editing and how health is ex actually experimenting on it right now. Especially is on the morals about it because I know the eastern part of the world, in particular China, is doing experimentation on HIV resistant uh, humans right now. Would you say that the western approach is too strict, that we should experiment more what is your stance on this? Um, yes, yes, a, a sentence. What do you think about the conclusions of the recent research that we had about HIV being Across, the yeah, good. I apologize, I'm, I suffer from tinnitus, so I have noises in my head. They've yet to turn into voices, so I'm still okay, but um, I, ca I can't always hear. Now, this is sort of interesting. Actually, um, the, the, the Chinese authorities are not so different from the authorities in Western Europe. What, what was there is that a rogue scientist managed to, uh, to um, do something, which in fact the authorities didn't want doing, and in fact that person was imprisoned, as you, as you probably know. Uh, but um, wh what it meant was, it was in fact, curiously, for, for, uh, for China, they didn't have control over what was actually um, happening. But the point you're making is, is a correct one, that there is a diversity of what is acceptable in a variety of things in different countries. And that makes the, um, uh, the issues of what I was talking about, uh, uh, about the relationship of science and politics, um, really quite difficult. Because um, not only do you have to deal with the problem in how it relates to a particular society or community, but that, of course, those different communities may have quite different opinions. And of course, that's been somewhat of a problem with the European Union or the United States. Let's take the simple one of the United States over abortion, for example. And this is causing huge tensions. Now, I, I don't have a solution for that, but what the only way through that is talk, 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 talk. And the problem is that so rapidly the warring battalions get um, it put in place, as we see in the US with the Democratic and Republican position over this issue, and it is impossible to talk anymore. So as long as you cannot talk about these issues in the human society, the human society will fail. It will fail, and America will fail if it can't sort this out. And this is only one example of it. So we have to have societies and communities that can talk about these issues. And not only that, 
we've got to do it on the world stage. Tough one, tough one, but that's what we, our, our children or our grandchildren have got to solve. There's no other solution because the world is globalized and we've got to deal with it. Now, I'm not utterly pessimistic about it because I'm, in fact, I'm hopelessly optimistic about the world mostly because I think we will solve it. Look at climate change. 20 years ago, it was, no, it was being utterly ignored. Now, we still haven't, of course, delivered what we uh, uh, deliver, but at least, at least, everybody is saying this is a major problem, and that's the first thing. And you wouldn't have predicted it 10, 15 years ago. And so, maybe there's hope. Thank you. Liz? Other questions? Here? First of all, thank you to have dedicated your life to science. Thank you. The question are two. Uh, first of all, uh, do you think the cell is something like a fundamental constituent of uh, uh, the origin of life? Like in the origin of the universe, cell was, was the first constituent? Or is it possible that did it assemble itself through other um, uh, inorganic constituents first? And second, the can I yeah. do, do it one at a, a time? So I think the question was about the origin of life and the, the, the way. Now, th th this is why are you all asking me such difficult questions? You know, I mean, um, w I I really struggle with the origin of life. There's very I read quite a lot of books about it. I mean, they're very nicely written. They have to be speculative, but you probably have read them yourself. But I mean. The, the point is, we cannot make life in one go as we know it now. Uh, you know, we need the chemical machine and we need the genes in it working as, uh, in a particular way. And the whole thing, you can't do one thing without the other. And of course, what people have suggested, well, maybe in, you know, these hydrothermal vents with heat, maybe there's little structures you know, holes in the rocks or whatever, and they start getting some chemistry going, and there's hypercycles, and maybe something could happen. And the problem is we can't easily do experiments on it because we can't go back three and a half billion years ago, um, and we don't quite know what's going on, but maybe, maybe there is, I mean, there are interesting ideas out there. You asking me what I think's right? Your ideas, I would like I to know. I don't know, I only think that it did happen. And so there must be an explanation for it. And perhaps we'll get nearer to it, but we probably never will know. Second question, yes. Uh, I would like to have a comment on that. Is it an uh, easier one, by the what way? What is easier? Um, I don't think so, <laughs> but I try. Uh, I've read Schrodinger's book. I've read uh, Monod's book, Eccles' book, and uh, Prigogine also. And uh, so I agree with you, and I think it's not possible to build life, honestly. This is my opinion. And the second question is, it will be possible in future to build life from inorganic components that is related for the first one? Yes, so, I mean, the, uh, the uh, you said inorganic, you were thinking like clay particles and so on, yeah? Yeah. Well, there was an interesting guy called Ken, um, who wrote a book on this, actually, about 30 years ago. Was it Cairns or, um, I'm trying to remember, not Cairns himself, was it Cairns Smith? Anyway, he, he had an interesting, do you know the book I'm talking about? Uh, if you don't you remember the title? It's the, I'll, I'll explain it, because I remember the idea, but not the person. No, it wasn't, I, it wasn't Manfred Eigen. This was very interesting. He applied the idea of, um, what he wanted to do was to combine hereditary with action. It's the point I was saying that DNA, you have information encoded, and, but no chemistry. Proteins, you have lots of chemistry, but not encoded information. And he postulated that um, particles of clay might have been the primitive life. And that the particles of clay would accumulate by inorganic means, um, but they may be, there may have been certain characteristics of them, like having certain um, ions around, like zinc or calcium, whatever it was, that they would flake more readily and therefore reproduce more readily and therefore would outgrow 
the competition of normal clay particles. And so he was trying to imagine um, conflating the information with the chemistry and a primitive system, in this case clay, um, that could form life. Now, turning that into life as we now know it <laughs> is almost as difficult as inventing <laughs> that sort of thing in the first place. But what was good about it is it made us think about what we need to think about. So I think it uh, complete unlikely to be true, but at least it made us focus on the problems. So I, I, I enjoyed reading the book. I heard him lecture once, um, and um, I'm talking about 1970, um, 75 or something. Um, but I don't think the I don't think the inorganic precursor helps us to get the organic one. We need, in my view, polymers, and um, we need polymers, and we need molecule. We need atoms that can build polymers. And uh, that, that's the only th way I can see going forward. Thank you. Another one there? This. So uh, I have one, just one question. Very um, good. <laughs> <laughs> on the purpose of life. So, so far, what I've understood about the purpose of all species is just like Richard Dawkins already said that the genes are very selfish, we evolve. All species evolve in the way that we become the fittest, not just have the longest lifetime, but to have the longest passing of genes. So to reproduce and make sure that our offsprings would carry on the genes for the longest of time. So that was what I understood about the, the purpose of evolution and of life. Except for humans, I was a, a little bit perplexed about that because I think that humans also behave in this way, in this way of um, evolution. But if you tell a human being that your purpose of life is to reproduce, he would get badly offended. I think that's, that's the case for most people. So I don't know if we are really a mutant or are we just denying the, um, the purpose of life? Yeah. So uh, um, let, let's talk a little bit more about purpose. Because we, uh, one of the other reasons why purpose is, um, um, is difficult for biologists to talk about is because we um, too quickly um, retreat into what purpose means for a human being. And that, in turn, um, if, you know, we have a purpose in what we're doing, I think, as, as you were talking about, and living. I think that's what you were referring to. If, if I've got it wrong, you can explain to me later. I'm using purpose in the same meaning of the word purpose, but not in a human context. I'm using purpose as behavior, holistic behavior of an entity, not one with consciousness, because purposeful behavior and consciousness is, a, a, is a, a more complex issue. I'm simply only using it in to describe an entity that behaves as a whole and therefore has a purpose. So once we drift into the perfectly legitimate issue of consciousness and how that defines purpose too, um, we put over another layer of complexity, which I don't want to address when I use the word purpose. Um, I'm looking at you and not sure I've answered your question. Did I get the wrong thing or was it roughly okay? Okay, good, right. A last one over there, please. Hi, it's Agostino. Thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Uh, just a quick question about the, uh, um, the theory of evolution. There is still a debate about the, um, the possibility of update the theory of evolution, uh, especially after the advent of next generation sequencing. And I just want to know your point about that. Thank you. Well, uh, we've got an evolutionary <laughs> biologist over here who could probably do a better uh, job of it than I am, because I'm not an evolutionary biologist, though I do um, think about it. I, I, a couple of questions about modern thinking, and then maybe you might want to comment on this, because this is your territory. Um, uh, what we have seen with, um, with the fantastic DNA sequencing that can be now done, 
which allows comparisons um, across many different organisms and which allows us to track genetic changes in real time, which are relevant to thinking about evolutionary processes, is a really a great advance in um, trying to think about the mechanisms of evolution. So I really think it's very, very powerful and is being used very um, effectively. There are some um, who, because uh, you talked about new theories of evolution, who sort of um, think about evolution um, in a sort of somewhat different context of uh, which sort of escapes, or they want to escape to some extent pure natural selection, and that may have been what you were thinking of there. Now, th this, is, this is a complicated topic, and I want to hear your views on it as well, because um, there's some sense in what they say, but um, I, I don't think it's a revolution in any stretch of the imagination, is my, my view, whereas they tend to portray it as a revolution. And what is it, as I, my understanding it is, is, is like this. If you imagined um, there were mountains of, and troughs between ideal sort of solutions or satisfactory solutions, sorry, satisfactory um, solutions, um, that, they, that the structure of the way that a living thing works means that there are only certain parts of what one might call the phenotypic phase space, and forgive me if that sounds too complicated, that can be occupied. And as a consequence of that, that evolution is, can only go in certain directions, because it can only go from one position in that phase space to another. Now, I think that is a perfectly legitimate point to raise, but I don't think it is as revolutionary as is argued, because in actual fact, even Darwin himself said some things that were a little similar to that. Because what it means is, is that a, a, a living object cannot occupy all possible chemistries and all possible ways of functioning and all possible ways of uh, managing information. So there are limitations to the places where life can go for life still to be operational. And therefore, what natural selection can do is only choose within a limited set of, 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 of of options. But it isn't a million miles from saying, with the life and the chemistry we have, that it won't work at a thousand degrees centigrade. I mean, it is, of course it won't work at a thousand degrees centigrade because it couldn't work. And all this is is a somewhat more sophisticated way of saying there are ways of pushing um, by uh, genetic uh, changes into places where it won't work. And when it doesn't work, it dies. And so that's the end of it. It is not radical, but it is something we have to talk about. I don't know if you want to add anything to this. I, I agree with you, absolutely. It's, it's, it's something very interesting that has happened today in the evolutionary theory of evolution because uh, one of the principles of life is exactly to be able to evolve according to natural selection, variation, inheritance. So what we call the Darwinian core that is still valid for any evolutionary explanation. But what is interesting in this case is that it's this Darwinian core is so flexible and so influential that it's able to include completely new factors, like genetic drift was not a Darwinian process, in, uh, in, but now we can include it in, in a Darwinian or new Darwinian or more pluralistic but still Darwinian explanation of evolution. The same is true for speciation. According to Darwin, speciation should be just gradual a divergence of population. Today, we know that speciation could be very rapid, could be due to uh, gray mutations. And so now we know much more than with respect to Darwin times. But what is interesting is this case, the uh, Darwinian research program is including, is, is becoming more and more pluralistic, but still valid in its core. So it's not a revolution, but it's something like a, uh, an integration and expansion of the Darwinian way to explain evolution. And we can find Darwinian principle even in the RNA word or in the DNA, in within the DNA and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it's my view. This way. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. It's been...
It's been what what is usual to say, but in this case, it's not rhetoric. It's been a privilege to dialogue with you this afternoon in the hall where Galileo taught for 18 years. So we we are so happy to to have have been uh, have been with you for this dialogue. So thank you. Now you have to come to the botanical garden and then to the anatomical theater. So thank you so much for being and here. And thank you for the questions. Thank you.